Good morning, and welcome to this session from Los Cabos to Vladivostok, the G20's impact on global economic growth. My name is Alejandro Ramirez. I'm CEO of Cinepolis and Chairman of the B20. Since December of last year, President Felipe Calderón of Mexico has chaired the, B20, the G20, a position he will hold until November 30th of this year, when Mexico will turn the G20 presidency to Russia. During its last summit in Los Cabos in June, the G20 agreed to work collectively to strengthen demand and restore confidence with a view to support growth and foster financial stability. To this end, the G20 agreed on a, on a coordinated Los Cabos Growth and Jobs Action Plan. One of the hallmarks of President Calderón's presidency of the G20 has been his openness to listen to the views of the business community and his conviction that business and governments working together can better solve some of the most pressing global challenges. For the past year, the G20 and its business counterpart, the B20, have been working together on critical issues, many of which were put for the first time on the G20 agenda by President Calderón, like green growth and financial inclusion, and some others like food security, employment, and anti-corruption, in which both the private and the public sector have key roles to play. One of the legacies of President Calderón to the G20 will no doubt be his emphasis on accountability and follow-up to past G20 commitments. Through his leadership, the G20 agreed to establish a Los Cabos Accountability Assessment Framework that establishes the procedures to report on progress in implementing policy commitments. As this may be one of President Calderón's last international business summits as President of Mexico, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank him for being such a good friend of the international business community and for his consistent support of policies that are so central to economic growth, like freer trade and investment. Please welcome me, welcome, uh, uh, join me in welcoming uh, His Excellency, President Felipe Calderón Hinojosa of Mexico. Thank you, Alejandro. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor to be here with you today. I want to take this opportunity to explain what we have done during the Mexican G20 presidency, what has been achieved so far, and what can we expect as we move towards the Russian presidency. Mexico is the first Latin American nation and the second emerging economy to chair the G20. We accepted this responsibility in a world with significant financial problems, as you know. It was essential to act quickly, make progress, and deliver results. To develop, to develop our agenda and reinforce the credibility of the G20, we made a major effort to foster dialogue between members of the group and to engage non-G20 countries as well as business representatives, academics, civil society leaders, unions, and the young. First of all, I have to say that Mexico has had its own share of economic adversity. In past decades, my country suffered several economic crises. But we learned from these experiences and mistakes and built a resilient economy with strong foundations. Like many countries, we went through the worst part of the financial crisis three years ago. As an export-led economy, our performance relies in our trade partners. When American imports fell, our GDP shrunk more than 10 percent two quarters in a row in 2009. Nevertheless, Mexico faced this challenge with determination. We implemented countercyclical measures to save jobs, 
and keep our industries afloat. We also increased government transfer to the poorest and established a temporary jobs program. But we knew that these counter-cyclical measures had to be short-lived. We put in place an exit strategy to reduce our fiscal deficit. This included increasing tax revenues, reducing public expenditures, promoting structural reforms, an aggressive deregulation program, and trade liberalization. We also reduced tariffs and ratified our free trade agreements. We have free trade agreements with more than 40 nations, and that implies that Mexico is able to sell its products to more than one billion consumers around the world. And we even increase investment in both infrastructure projects and technological education to boost our competitiveness. Today, in Mexico, there are 130,000 new engineers and technicians every single year. These efforts have paid off. Today, Mexico has its public finances in order with a fiscal deficit of less than 1% of GDP. We have an all-time record in foreign reserves, $160 billion, more than twice our total foreign debt. Exports are booming, and we have gained competitiveness in several high-value sectors like the automotive industry. In 2006, for instance, we were the ninth largest exporter of cars in the world. We are the fourth. Two days ago, we announced a new investment in a new plant, a new plant facility of Audi in Mexico, the first, the first of this enterprise in the whole continent of America, an investment of more than $1.3 billion in our country. Mexico, for instance, now exports more manufactured goods than the rest of Latin America and Caribbean combined. And our economy has grown almost 16% in the last three years. The global perspectives were dire when we assumed the G20 presidency. As you remember, the previous meeting in France, in Cannes, concluded without clear commitments and without a sense of direction. It seemed that the crisis was not only deep, but also out of control. In this context, the Mexican presidency had to coordinate complex negotiations during the months prior to the Los Cabos summit. It was clear that we urgently needed to strengthen the financial support mechanism for countries most affected by the crisis. That is why one of our priorities was to recapitalize the International Monetary Fund. Last February, the G20 finance minister examined several options to make sure that resources to the fund could be mobilized promptly. In March, the Eurozone agreed to combine the capacity of their lending facilities, the European, European Stability Mechanism and the European Financial Stability Fund, and to increase the speed of capitalization of the ESM. And last April, G20 finance ministers and central bankers agreed to a broad international effort to strengthen the IMF. Finalizing the G20 agenda requires several ministerial meetings to address problems and implement proper policy initiatives on issues that went beyond just the economic crisis. Some of these issues included trade liberalization, job creation, and financial inclusion. We tried to strike a balance between the urgent and the important, between the long run and the short run. This is how things stood 
as the summit in Los Cabos began. There, we work in three areas. First, we propose macroeconomic and structural policies to solve out our short-term problems in the world. Second, the countries promoted policies to guarantee strong growth in the medium and long term. And third, we incorporated environmental sustainability and access to affordable basic goods as key policies. One of the most important outcomes of Los Cabos was that at a time when there were serious doubts about the Euro's viability, all G20 members agreed to support measures that will strengthen European integration in areas such as fiscal policy, banking system, and regulatory frameworks in the whole area. It was also crucial to boost demand without creating new debt problems in order to restore growth. The Eurozone has been following this game plan. Just two days ago, as you know, the European Central Bank announced very significant measures to provide support to countries suffering from confidence problems and to make clear it will take every measure to keep the integrity of the Eurozone. Another important result was Los Cabos' action plan. It contained specific short-term measures to be implemented by all countries. Specific ideas from the Business 20 Group, the B20, were also included. We needed to strengthen the global response to international financial crisis in an interconnected world. To this end, we announced an increase in the resources available to the International Monetary Fund of more than 400, 450, 450, billion, 450 billion dollars. This is the largest injection ever in the history of this institution. Many non-G20 countries contribu contributed to this, as did many APEC members with generous amounts. We showed that together we could come up with global solutions to global problems. Unfortunately, to regain fiscal sustainability, we have to reduce fiscal deficits at a time of economic slowdown. But if this is done in a bold and credible way, negative impacts on aggregate demand could be minimized. In the case of external imbalances that still threaten global stability, we need countries to move towards more open markets, including for exchange rates, and to place a greater emphasis on a stronger domestic demand to reduce those gaps. The other priorities of the G20, which are also priorities for us today here in Vladivostok, were one, to maintain and strengthen our commitment to free trade. The main message we need to emphasize is what the world needs today to overcome this crisis, crisis is more trade, not less. Therefore, we extended our standstill commitment until 2014. It would be very important if APEC economies could send a strong message in favor of trade from this summit. Two, to support the process of strengthening financial regulation and supervision, as well as the Financial Stability Board. Well-allocated credit is a very powerful instrument for development. These are the lessons that Latin American and Asian countries have painfully learned during our crisis. On, fo on food security, we agreed to increase public and private investment in agriculture, as well as to carry out actions to increase agricultural productivity. We can implement policies to reduce price volatility. Four, on sustainable development, we agreed to include green growth policy options within the G20 structural reform agenda. Green growth is a way to economic recovery. APEC economies 
have an important role to play both in financing and in creating awareness around the climate change problems and solutions in the way of the Green Growth Path. All, all of these actions are significant steps to reach our common objective of a strong, sustainable, and balanced growth. The road ahead. Dear friends, it is clear that the global economy continues to face important challenges. However, the international economic outlook has improved a lot. The balance of risk has changed in our favor. Let's see. One year ago, the Cannes summit was interrupted several times to discuss the possibility of Greece leaving the Eurozone. That discussion is over, and Greece is no longer a pressing issue. Countries with liquidity problems like Spain and Italy have implemented structural adjustments, and European and international institutions have taken critical measures such as building a strong and credible firewall. The G20 summit in that sense, in Los Cabos, appears to have been a turning point. The long road to recovery is now clear, and with committed leadership, I'm confident a new period of global growth will begin very soon. The advances we have made this year make it clear that dialogue and cooperation are the best way forward. The Mexican presidency of the G20 will continue working to strengthen the world's confidence in this forum's capacity to address pressing problems. As investors start to believe, as consumers start to believe, we will be on the road to a strong and sustained recovery. We are pleased that Russia will assume the G20 presidency next December after hosting this successful APEC summit. We are, sure, we are sure that this great country will live up to these responsibilities by leading global efforts to restore growth and create jobs. And Mexico will continue to be a loyal and committed ally in the effort to build and maintain our people's prosperity. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. We have uh, some time for questions and answers. Since this is an interactive session, uh, the floor is open for um, any of your questions, and there are uh, the mics. Yes, in the back, uh, the gentleman. Presidente Calderón, Luis Villegas de Colombia. Quisiera su opinión sobre la nueva iniciativa del Arco del Pacífico de México, Chile, Perú y Colombia. ¿Cuál es su visión sobre ese nuevo hecho económico y político de América Latina? Brevemente en español. Yo creo que es una de las iniciativas más importantes de comercio e integración económica y yo diría también de solidaridad política en Latinoamérica en los últimos años. I think it's one of the most important efforts in order to strengthen the inter economic and commercial integration between Latin American countries. The Pacific Alliance made between Mexico, Colombia, Peru y Chile has a tremendous potential in the area. As I was saying, Mexico only exports more manufacturers than the rest of all Latin American and Caribbean countries, Caribbean countries combined. So you can imagine the potential of this new commercial area. Now, we are advancing 
really fast in that integration. We are organizing several meetings in the year. Actually, we organize probably the first virtual meeting through internet, at least in our region, some months ago. And we are exploring not only economic and commercial issues, but also how to integrate, for instance, our stock exchange markets between the four countries. So we are establishing a common platform for investment, trade, uh, economic growth, and of course, at the same time, we are establishing a common floor for the political pers perspective. And the Pacific Alliance will be a very strong platform in order to conquer, in order to advance in the integration of the trade of the whole Pacific Sea. That initiative is in addition of other initiatives. For instance, Me Mexico started and now is part of the negotiation of the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And in that sense, we are making a big and bold decision in favor of the future. If we explore where the economic growth is going to be in this decade, clearly, clearly the economic growth will be here in the Pacific Sea. And we have the privilege as Latin American countries to share the Pacific Sea. And that, that is the key issue of our alliance. There are another advantages of this agreement. One of them is it has some kind of geopolitical sense. We know, for instance, that Mercosur is an economic initiative, but also it has a lot of political sense. Well, in that sense, the, the whole activity of our four countries in the Pacific Alliance, our exports, our investment is bigger right now than the investment and export of the Mercosur countries. And in that sense, we are advancing even faster in terms of integration. We are reducing tariffs. We are establishing more commitments in terms to open the trade between us and that will be a clear advantage. In a few words, for me, the Pacific Alliance is a strategic step in order to foster economic growth and prosperity for the countries in Latin America which share the Pacific Sea. And I hope that in the future we can receive another members, like Panama or Costa Rica, which are very interested on that. Thank you, Mr. President. I don't know if there are any other questions uh, from the floor. There's... That's great. But I think, I, I think that everything is absolutely clear. <laughs> uh, and every, everybody is happy with the G20 <laughs> performance. On my understanding. So oh, thank you. Uh, there's a question here in the center, I'm sorry. Yes, um, there's a mic. Could you please pass the mic? Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Um, you're an outgoing leader with a successful track record behind you. Uh, what two pieces of advice would you have to people coming uh, into your kind of position around the world now about how to be a successful political leader. Thank you for your comment. I think that the most important advice for any person is to stand on principles. And talking about economic issues, standing on principle is to believe and to work for economic freedom. Um, probably is one of the main discussions we have ahead. I can, I, I can feel a lot of pressure, for instance, against economic freedom. 
I used to talk about a tail in the G20 meetings since we went to the first one in Washington, D.C. There is some kind of, of uh, sacred clause talking about we reject protectionism. However, the day after of that statement, 15 out of 20 countries of the G20 established new tariffs and new barriers to the trade. And in particular, in, in crisis time, there is a lot of pressure coming from the economic sectors and industries, pushing governments in order to establish more barriers to trade. And probably that is the worst mistake we can make. The solution in order to recover economic growth, or one very important part of the solution, is trade, more trade, more open markets, less tariffs, not more tariffs. And that is the future of that. That is, uh, it's a lesson coming from thousands of years ago. Man, the man started to prosper with trade. And that is the only way in which we can overcome this crisis. This crisis. And the second, standing on principles, is the same. We must to believe and support freedom and democracy in any point of the world. Probably we in Latin America, we did believe in some moment, probably 12 or 15 years ago, that democracy arrived, uh, that was the end of the story. And that is not true. We need to stand for democracy and for freedom. We need to fight for them every single day. And the future of humankind only be clear and prosperity only could come if we do believe that democracy and freedom are human principles that no one country could reject. So my advice is stand on principles, believe and fight for freedom and democracy in economic and in politics as well. Here in the middle. Please. Okay, Your Excellency, I am a student from Peking University, China, so I'm really interested in the food security. And I know you've just talked, uh, addressing this gentleman's question, you talk about the open market. And I'm wondering, what's the impact of the, of, of, of maybe the potential open market to, is, what's the impact of the open, open market to the domestic, the Mexico domestic food, food uh, market? So I, I wanted to hear your opinion on that. And the second thing is, since we know that Mexico has hosted the G, the, just the, hosted the G20 summit, and I'm wondering what's Mexico's definition of itself in the G20? Thank you. What, what is the second question? Excuse me, so, can you repeat again? Uh, what's Mexico's definition of itself? What's the role it's okay. going to play in the G20? So thank you. Well, uh, talking about the first, I do believe in trade. And the benefits of trade, not only in a textbook, but also the reality is Trade provide, provides benefits for consumers and provides benefits for producers as well. We need to defeat that idea that only exports are good, are good and imports are bad. Trade is good, either export or imports, especially today. Why trade provides benefit for consumers? Because it's the only way in which you can get the best price and the best quality for any single product, in particular for food. Today, we have some kind of a scarcity in the food market. But if we establish restrictions to the trade in food, in particular, if we establish restrictions to exporting foods, 
We are making a big mistake, and we are establishing the ground economic incentives for more production of food. The only way in which the people who is, are able to produce more food is liberalizing prices, liberalizing trade, and that could allocate the right resources in the right persons in the right places. And now talking about uh, the, the world economy. Today we are talking about an economy founded or based on middle products. It's a big mistake to believe that as long a country is able to export and non-import is making right. A country needs to export and import at the same time. For instance, in addition to our free trade agreements in Mexico, we reduced tariffs in the middle of the crisis from 12% on average to 4% on average today for any country out of the countries we have free trade agreements. And what happened? Manufacturers in Mexico increased their competitiveness in several ways. For instance, we are opening the markets for any inputs for electronic supplies. Now, today, Mexico is the largest producer of smart mobile phones. Actually, 65% of the total BlackBerry in the world were made in Guadalajara, in Mexico. And the only way why BlackBerry and Toyota and Honda and Audi and Volkswagen and a lot of uh, producers and manufacturers are establishing in Mexico is because we have a very open economy. And that implies benefits for consumers around the world with the best products. And that implies benefits for producers and workers in Mexico with the best manufacturers. I think that the same is in, in thinking about food. We need a lot of structural reforms even inside my country in agricultural sector, yes. But the main principle is exactly the same. As long as you are able to open the economy, you could provide more opportunities to eat to your people than the other way around. A closed economy is a threat for food security in the people. There are another points that we need to address talking in a food security. For instance, the financial part of the equation. Like four years ago, the, the financial firms participating in food market had probably 8% of the market. The rest, 92%, were enterprises more linked with the food itself distributors or producers and so on. But now, more than 40% of the market in food market is made by financial firms through derivatives market and others. And that implies probably some kind of, uh, that could have some kind of impact in the determination of the price. I don't want to use the word speculation, but this very abrupt variation in the price of commodities in last years could, could have some kind of a relationship with the participation of financial markets. And we need to explore and regulate in a better manner the participation of this market in this crucial issue for the people. But the main issue in terms of agricultural products and food, um, food security is productivity of food. And in that sense, we need to invest a lot in new technology, a new kind of organization in order to produce even more with the same resources and without threatening natural resources like uh, forests, for instance, or um, preserving water and other natural resources, we need to increase the productivity with the actual resources that we are producing those foods. Yes, there is time for just one final question. The gentleman in the middle. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'm Vyacheslav Nikonov, member of the Russian Duma. Uh, you uh, made a very strong statement about the principles of free trade democratization for your country. 
but it, it looks like that uh, the continent of Latin America is moving in a somewhat different direction. They're electing very left-wing governments, uh, which are protectionist, sometimes nationalist. They organize groups like Bolivarian group, which is looking uh, in somewhat different direction. So my question is, where is the continent of Latin America moving politically? Good question. Uh, some years ago, I told in Davos that Latin America had a struggle between the past and the future. In economic terms, what is the past? The past is closed economies. The past is protectionism. The past is nationalism and expropriation of foreign industry, for instance. And what is the future? The future is freedom. The future is trade. The future is investment, national and foreign investment, global investment. And that means prosperity. And the same in political terms. What is the past in political terms? The past is authoritarianism, either right, right, rightist dictatorship or leftist dictatorship. For me, it's the same uh, dictatorship coming from the left or coming from the right. It's the same problem. It's a problem of lack of freedom. It's a problem of lack of democracy. It's a problem of lack of human rights. And we have suffered, and actually we are suffering still, some authoritarian regimes in the country. The future in politics is democracy. It's freedom press freedom, freedom for meeting, and human rights. And today, Latin America is struggling exactly between the past and the future. And that battle is inside each country. There will be elections very soon in some countries, for instance, in Venezuela next month. There was some kind of change of regime recently in Paraguay. Uh, but the point is, as long we are able to preserve democracy, in the sense that as, as long we are able to preserve the right of the people to decide which government they prefer, we are in the right side. People could make a lot of mistakes even through free elections. Nevertheless, the people of one country only can learn what could be the right direction through democracy. I don't believe in authoritarian solution. But my point is this, and this is my final comment, in particular for my Latin American friends in business or in government or in civil society leadership. We need to fight and stand for principles of freedom and democracy. We need to talk about those principles. We need to raise the voice against any authoritarian act coming from any government. Doesn't matter if that government is a leftist government or rightist government. We need to talk about the conquest of Latin America in the last two decades, and one of the most precious conquests is precisely democracy. And in some cases, we are losing that victory. And at the same time, we need to learn about our own experiences. You can pick examples of leftist regime or rightist regime, but even the, our own experience 
could teach a lot for anyone. For instance, we need to learn how Chile is one of the most prosperous nations in the whole region. We need to learn how Chile today has a welfare among its people, has a very important economic growth. Chile has the biggest economic growth today in the OECD countries. And at the same time, we have a lot of experiences in Latin America coming from countries that establish other regimes. And the situation of the people clearly is not, is not good for any one of them. I think that uh, that is the battle in Latin America. It is not clear what could be the final decision of Latin American people, but what is a fact is that we reach in one moment, at least in most of the countries of the region, democracy and free economies, and we are losing those spaces in several countries in a different grade and different perspective. That is not good news for Latin America. In the future, we, the leaders, and you, the businessmen, and any serious participant in civil society, we need to come together and raise our voices in order to push forward again the principles in which we do believe. So that it could be my idea. But I hope that Latin America will be a free continent, a free region, sooner or later. And I do prefer sooner, because the people demands and deserve that very soon. So thank you, all of you, for your questions. Thank you very much.